Hi, I'm Janine. This is KUCI 88.9 FM in Irvine, and this is Get the Funk Out. Standing by to join me is Miriam Feldman. She's the author of the debut memoir, He Came In With It, A Portrait of Motherhood and Madness. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Tell me what it was like when you finally decided to write this book. Well, the book was fomenting for a long time. Um... I was 10 years into all of this when I finally sat down and wrote it. But in the very beginning, I had felt so isolated and and so um, alone, like I was on an island. People didn't talk about it. I didn't have any firsthand knowledge of serious mental illness. And somewhere along the way in the first year or so, I thought to myself, you know, when if I live through all of this, I'm going to write a book because I want to tell this story because I think that it will make it more understandable and less frightening for people who are going through it. And now, 15 years in the rearview mirror, I think if I had had my book to pick up and read 15 years ago, it would have been such a lifeline. So I'm hoping it's going to be that for other people. You would have felt less alone and yeah like, yeah understood and you know a lifeline not in i mean god knows it's not uh the answer to any questions or a how-to or some kind of roadmap because it really isn't one but to me that's the important message is that there's no right way there's no nobody can tell you how to do this because really a disease like schizophrenia is bespoke for each person so everybody's experience is different but just to know you're not alone and to know that there are other people going through it makes all the difference. So tell me, walk me through what happened. Did you have these signs that your son, Nick, um, he was having these issues and then he was diagnosed? What, what happened? Well, you know, his whole childhood was a charmed childhood. He was handsome and smart and extremely talented. He's a very talented artist. Tons of friends. I mean, no signs of anything. I mean, now I can look back on it and identify very subtle things because I'm overly educated on all of it. But he had a great childhood. And when he got to be a teenager, he started having problems. But the thing is, if you were to make the list of red flags for serious mental illness and the list of normal teenage behavior, you'd have virtually the same list. I mean, they're all crazy. They're mercurial. They're um, they're argumentative. They make no sense. They're impulsive. You know, they're manipulative. Things. Yeah, everything. And so I would. How much at, time do we have? Yeah, we'll <laughs> do an hour on that. Um, but and and so in the beginning, you just have no no sense, no way to think that something's wrong. But as the time went by, and I saw his friends more, you know, growing out of it and becoming more mature. He was getting worse. And that was the point at which I started to think something's going on. But it was a long learning curve. At first, we thought it was drugs. Um, and it was, but that wasn't the main problem. He was self-medicated. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering if he had gone through any trauma. But no, it was more like he was just taking drugs. And then that... Yeah, you know, I mean, no. He ha he didn't have any major trauma, not that I know of. And... Um, but the thing with the drugs is, you know, that also, back when he's 15, 16, 17, I mean, they're all smoking pot and trying different things. And we as parents are scrambling to mitigate and get control and do all of that. And I mean, he wasn't doing anything any of his friends weren't doing, but they all, again, grew out of it. But what I realize now with Nick is he was starting to have auditory hallucinations. He was hearing voices in his head. And so it's very textbook that they start to do drugs or alcohol or something to self-medicate because these frightening things are happening to them. They're not equipped to talk about it because they don't understand what it is and they're hiding it. And so they start to self-medicate and then the vicious cycle is that the drugs in turn make the mental illness worse. Yes. Yeah. So how did you cope with all of this? What, what walk me through what happened? Well, uh, I have three daughters and Nick and a son, and the oldest daughter was out of the house, but I still had 
two young girls at home. One was nine and one was like 11 or so when this started. And so I was really scrambling to create some sort of normalcy and keep the home a safe place. But really, serious mental illness is like a gale force hurricane that just blows through your life. And anything that's not securely nailed down is just gone. And as that happened, I found myself increasingly just in damage control mode all the time. And I had to attend to Nick because you have to attend to the biggest fire. But for the girls, it was very hard because they were marginalized and they didn't get the attention they should have had. And it really turned your whole family upside down. Right. It was difficult. But as time went on, I learned, I educated myself, I read a lot of books, I asked for help. I finally, at age 40 something, learned how to ask for help. And, um, and, I learned to manage it a little bit better, but it, it wasn't easy, as you'll yeah. read in the book. <laughs> what else would you like people to know about your book? Well, it's raw and it's very honest. I decided when I sat down to write this that there was no point in doing this if I wasn't real. And so, again, it's not any kind of a roadmap, maybe a roadmap sometimes for what not to do. But it's my story and it's real and it will give other people, other moms dealing with this specific situation, but other moms in general, and I think just people in general, a place to understand that we are all struggling and we are all doing our best and we're all just trying to figure it out. And there's no perfect family and there's no perfect kid and striving for that kind of stuff is just frustration and pointless. And now, this many years later, my family isn't what I thought it was gonna be. Nothing's the way I had imagined it, but I have a strong, beautiful, flawed, crazy family, and we are devoted to each other. And um, Nick has three sisters who would do anything for him. And to me, that's kind of a success story as a family. That's great. How is he doing? He's doing quite well right now. Um, he, we left LA and we moved up to Washington. We live in rural Washington, my husband and I. And Nick lives in a supported housing in the town nearby. And he's doing quite well. I mean, you know, the, the, the bar has changed, you know. He doesn't have a job, he doesn't have relationships, but he's healthy and he's lucid and he's content and we're Good. in the process of doing a medication change that I have high hopes for. Good. Uh, what else would you like people to know about your book? Um, I think that it's an example of how to deal with curveballs, how to deal with life throwing you something that you never expected and learning how to regroup and accept and build forward from there to stop resisting, to stop resisting what you can't change and build around it or move through it. A lot of this I learned in yoga and meditation, which is something I took up during all of this because I was just losing it. And it's not something I ever would have imagined I was suited to, but it really did change my worldview. And I think surrender to what you can't change and acceptance is the key to happiness. Definitely. What I want to ask, because you mentioned curveballs in my show, is called Get the Funk Out, is what did you do during this time when you felt like perhaps your world was crumbling, what did you do to take care of yourself to keep resilient? I know you mentioned yoga. Well, it was a little bit of a learning curve again, because the first year or two, what I did was drink a lot of wine and um, cry like in the bathroom stuff. at night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cry in the bathroom at night with the shower running so that my kids wouldn't hear me because I was busy pretending everything was okay, which was a folly because they knew everything wasn't okay. One night I came out of that bathroom and I was busted by my nine-year-old and she said, mom, why are you crying? And I said, I'm crying because I miss your brother. 
And she said, what do you mean you miss Nick? Nick's not gone. Nick's still here. And I said to her, yeah, he is, but he's not who he was supposed to be. And she looked me right in the eye and she said, yeah, he is. It's just not what you thought. And then oh. just turned and walked. <laughs> and I sat down in the window seat and I was like, whoa. Yes. And that was the pivot point. That was the turning point where I realized if this nine-year-old gets it, I better get it. Yeah. And at that point, I started to reevaluate and change the way I was dealing with it. And I decided, okay, it's not what I thought, but this is how he came to me. You know, maybe it's not, maybe it wasn't evident when he was a little baby in my arms, but this is how he came into the world. I brought him here. It's my job to love him and be his mother, and I damn well better let go of the past and accept this. And at that point, I started to, and that's when I started going to yoga, meditating, and consciously remembering that. And I mean, the the nine-year-old is 27-year-old married woman now, and I still sometimes have to stop and remember what she said to me and regroup. What a gift that was. It was. What a it gift. Was. Yeah. Time. Mm. What advice would you give people that are going through similar roads right now with children? Get as much knowledge as you can. Educate, you know, knowledge is power. Educate yourself, read every book, talk to everybody you know, find out everything you can and let people in, you know, don't, don't put up a facade. Don't pretend everything's okay. Be honest. Let yourself break down. Let yourself feel the grief. Let yourself move through it and talk to people. And then once at whatever point in your trajectory that you have your footing, tell your story. Tell people, we need to hear these stories. We need to know, you know, one in four people in America deal with a mental health crisis or situation in their life. If you extrapolate that out, that means virtually everybody deals with mental illness, either first or second hand. So let's talk about it. Let's be real and let's make a place in our world for this subject and for these people, because this is their world too. And hiding Auntie in the closet or, you know, looking away from the guy on the street corner, that doesn't make them cease to exist. That just denies them their rightful place in this world. We need to make a place for these people. You're right. And especially right now with COVID, I feel like I'm hearing all kinds of stories of people breaking down from this. Yeah, we're only at the tip of what's going to happen, what the fallout from all of this is going to be. It's going to be a big issue. Right, right. I mean, I'm hearing stories of uh, verbal abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, people really, you know, crumbling. I mean, there's so many things going on between, you know, the job market being so dismal and just everything, working remotely, not being able to see people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, acknowledgement and awareness of mental health has got to become a very active part of our lives. I'll tell you a little funny sidebar to this is um, everybody's talking about how traumatic and the fallout of being isolated and, and, and um, having to stay home. I said to my daughter the other day, so tell me who is the person on this planet who is the perfect example of how to socially isolate and he hasn't had to change his life one bit and she said nick and i said that's right i mean nick is complete uh, because on top of everything nick has a little sprinkling of ocd i doubt if he has touched a doorknob in 10 years so it's like he's the perfect covid um quarantine person because he's perfectly happy and fine and it doesn't affect him at all that's so good. one good thing came out of it that's know? good but for everybody else it's tough that's true where can people find out more about you, Miriam? I have a website, which is miriam-feldman.com. And everything's on there. You know, I'm an artist and my Nick is an artist too. And all our work is on there. And about the family, about my mental health work. I'm, the, on, the, I'm on the advisory council of Bring Change to Mind, which is Glenn Close's nonprofit. And I'm active in NAMI. 
and all the links to the book are there, which is dropping tomorrow. And um, if anybody's interested, I'm also uh, offering to do any book club all over the country by Zoom. There's also a um, form that you can fill out that's on the website too. So that's the best place to go. Fantastic. I want to thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking to you. You too. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.